Third Places and Beyond. It's a fascinating conversation. Many of you are familiar with Third Places, but over the past two or three years, there's been another whole discussion happening about where do we go from there? When we think about connecting and Third Places, I think an important question is to what end? Where are we trying to go with those connections? It was Bill Hybels, as most of us recall, what, 20 or 30 years ago, made this statement that the church is the hope of the world. And his whole focus was to be sicker sensitive and to find on-ramps for the unchurched or the de-churched, and especially the next generation. But the important question is, is can we be the hope of the world without engaging the next generation as partners? Can we be the hope of the world if it's simply a connection? Or does it have to be more than that? And I think there's two really critical questions that we need to ask as we think about ministry today and engaging the next generation. One of those is really the question Hybels was, was dealing with, and that is, who are we trying to reach? And of course, we know today where we, we get demographic studies and we target our groups really intentionally, and that's a powerful thing. And I was talking to one of the ladies here in the audience a few minutes ago, and she was thinking, thinking about how do we use third places in the community to be on ramps to the church? Really important question. But we're learning there's another question that's just as important. And that's the question, what are we trying to create? Extremely important um, question. What are we trying to create? You know, the who are we trying to attract or who are we trying to reach question is really driven by Matthew 419, fishers of men. The what are we trying to create question is really driven by Matthew 28, 19, go make disciples. And a healthy church has to do both. So as we think through this, if you simply focus or if you over-focus on who are we trying to reach, the result is you create consumers. It was interesting in the packet that we had handed to us when we got here was this green card about ministry meltdown. Why are ministry leaders melting down? Interesting question. If we had time, we could probably have an hour's discussion on that topic alone. But I think one of the issues is we're creating consumers that are demanding services. And pastors are no longer pastors, they're CEOs of organizations creating services. If we really focus or balance with the question of what are we trying to create, and we focus on creating partners, it's an important step towards addressing that burnout question. Bill and I, kind of interestingly, met eight years ago as competitors. We both have companies that design and build churches. Bill's in Ohio and I'm in Indiana. It's fairly close. We compete. But we found that we shared a ministry heart about these kind of issues. And we started an organization called Cornerstone Knowledge Network that's all about developing and disseminating knowledge that radically improves how facilities enhance ministry. So we're all about doing research, understanding what's happening in ministry and culture and how facilities can help drive that. That organization got us into a relationship with Alan Hirsch. And um, of course, Alan talked yesterday at the keynote. Um, and we've been working with Alan in an organization called Future Travelers, which is an organization that is working with large church pastors to address that what are we trying to create question and learning how to develop ministry partners. So the content that you're going to hear here is driven by a three-year journey with a large a, a group of pastors from large churches trying to move from an attractional model to a missional model and what's entailed in that journey. And then at the end, we'll come around and address, um, we'll address these four issues. Who are we trying to reach? What happens when we create ministry partners? What are we trying to create? And how do we create ministry partners? I said partners are up, up there instead of consumers. But So let's jump into this. Lyle Schaller, who's a church consultant about 10 years ago, said the biggest challenge for the church of the 21st century is to develop a solution to the discontinuity and fragmentation of the American lifestyle. It's a big issue of what was happening in our communities. If you drill down a little bit, 
This is a research study done in 2007, and it discovered that the number of people saying there's no one with whom they discuss important matter had tripled in the last 10 years. Or nearly half the people, there's nearly half of the people have never, who have either no one or only one other person with whom they can discuss important matters. And you can see in the third one there, people who talk to at least one person who is not connected to them through kinship has dropped 30%. The reality is we become a very disconnected culture. There was a sociologist named Ray Oldenburg that was studying this phenomenon all around the globe. And he discovered that cultures that were healthy, that were connected, had three important places in their life. One of those was where they worked, or their home, excuse me. The first one is, is your home, obviously a place where you connect. The second place is your workplace. Typically, you have a culture, you have a team, you have connections at work that are very significant. Unhealthy cultures, like the U.S. had become, only had those first two. What Oldenburg discovered all around the globe was that healthy cultures had a third place, a place that was an anchor for community life that facilitated and fostered broader, more creative interaction. In Italy, it was a coffee shop. In Germany, it was the beer garden. It's quite interesting. Um, the attributes of a third place you can see here, their place of context and meaning, a place of stimulation, connection, and discovery, a place of searching and learning together. It was a destination, a place to go after work and kind of plug into the community and process what was going on in our world together. You guys may remember at Starbucks three or four years ago, in an effort to cut their costs, they tried to automate their processes. They were no longer grinding coffee in the store, and they lost that smell and the sounds of grinding coffee in the Starbucks facilities, and business dropped. It's pretty interesting. The issue of stimulation, connection, and discovery was real. An effective third place has that kind of stimulation and that kind of energy. Another important attribute of a third place is this issue of searching and learning together. It really needs to be a place of discovery. So if you think in your church, we're going to just put in a coffee shop and it's all going to work, it takes a lot more than that. It has to be a much more intentional ministry effort than simply putting in a coffee bar or a cafe. Ray Oldenburg, the author I just mentioned, who wrote that book, The Great Good Place, and coined that term, third place, um, met with us about 10 years ago at Community Christian Church in Chicago. We developed this roundtable discussion and invited him up, and we just wanted to drill into this third place question and what it could teach the church, what it could, um, how it could instruct us in ministry. At the end of the day, we asked him if, if he had any kind of overriding thoughts from the discussion. And Ray wasn't an overly passionate church guy. He was a sociologist. And he leaned back kind of quietly and he said, not only do I believe that third place is an opportunity for the church, but it's a responsibility. What was interesting is Howard Schultz kind of got it, didn't he? And he created that kind of a connecting place for our communities. And he developed one of the you know, fastest growing organizations in the US or around the globe the last 10 years. So connection is important, but it must be more. And that's the important conversation that we need to be having today. It must be more than just connection. I'm a part of a uh, campus ministry at Purdue University, and I work with young people. And working with young people, they tell me they want these four things from us older people. They say, we want to know you. We want to be known too. That's the connection part. But there's two other key parts of this. We want insight and we don't want to walk alone. If you want to develop a powerful connecting place or a powerful ministry, it's got to be about more than just attraction or connection. Yes, they want to be connected, but it's to a deeper purpose. They want insight and they want mentoring. They want direction. They want somebody to walk with them. 
Another interesting um, little interaction I had earlier um, this year with some students at Purdue, we were developing these smaller mentor groups, kind of small groups with, um, with the students and older guys. And um, one of the students looked at me a little cynical, wasn't sure if we were really committed, and he said, so how much time are you willing to give? And I'm a busy guy. I was a little unsure how to answer, and I said, well, how much time do you want? And he said, as much as you're willing to give. So an important part of this journey is us older people being willing to invest. It's got to be more than just connection. Because connection creates simply connection. Connection alone creates to, leads to creating ministry consumers. It's interesting, I was talking to a pastor recently who grew a church in four years from a startup to 1,100. He looked at me and said, I'm pretty good at shock and awe on Sunday. But he knew there was more to it as well. And so the question is, is shock and awe working? It does help us, you know, um, punch into a culture that's distracted and kind of unconcerned. So there's real value in that attractional element on Sunday. But again, there's got to be more than that. I would challenge you to go to YouTube and, uh, or just Google, or go to YouTube and search for teen statistics in two hours. It's fascinating, it's a video clip of what happens in youth groups across the United States every two hours, and it's startling. Another interesting bit of, of research is from Dave Kinneman, who uh, owns the Barna Group, and recently wrote this book, You Lost Me. You Lost Me is about a study of the 18 to 29 year old age group in America. 18 to 29 year old, more specifically, evangelical Christian young people in America. And here's what he found. 80% 80 of them are sexually active. 65% of all the abortions in the United States were uh, for evangelical women, which equals 650,000 evangelical abortions a year in the United States. It's kind of a stunning number. So when we simply create consumers and we don't ask that tougher question about what are we trying to create, we can get some troubling results. Bill, you want to jump in? Willow Creek did uh, some research several years ago. And uh, they actually would survey their congregation pretty much every year, but they decided to take a little bit of different tack this time and understand how spiritual growth actually developed. And the results were significant enough that it caused Bill Hybels to say that the disconnect between what we thought we were doing and what we were actually accomplishing was troubling and unacceptable. Now, spiritual growth is a, is a complex thing that's probably more, uh, more akin to a matrix than it is a linear progression. But, but what they found, I think, in, 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 uh, in their spiritual spectrum, I think is good to, in, in helping to understand exactly what does take place. And they were able to divide their congregation into four groups. And the first group was exploring Christianity. Now, these are the people that had not yet come to faith. Uh, the interesting thing about this group, paradoxically, the longer they're in church without accepting Christ, the less likely they are to ever accept Christ. It's kind of interesting. The second group, growing in Christ, are the ones that uh, presumably are new believers. They've, they've, they've recently come to faith, or at least you hope so. You know, over 10 years, you can have 10 years experience or one year of experience 10 times. Um, but hopefully you're moving uh, beyond this, this stage into close to Christ. Now, Jesus is a, is a significant part uh, of your life. There's one more step into this idea of being Christ-centered and it being completely about Jesus. I uh, was at a graduation ceremony a couple of years ago and the, the two valedictorians talked openly about their, about their faith and, and I went away from that and for some reason there was, there was something, there was, a, there was a bit of that that was, that was still troubling me. And I couldn't figure out why, because it was, um, you know, here were two, two girls just openly confessing their faith at a, at a public school graduation. But I realized what it was, was what they were saying was, I'm, I'm graduating from high school, I'm headed out on my journey to do my thing in my way, and God's job is to come alongside me and support me in my journey. Now, I'm not, I'm not at all making fun of those girls. I mean, they, they are light years 
ahead of where I was spiritually when I was that age. And, and they, they're on a, a, a great path. But when you think about the difference between close to Christ and Christ-centered, that's the step. In moving from God is significant in my, in my life doing my thing to it's not about me anymore. It's about what God's doing. In, in every church, their, their, their strategy can kind of, um, whatever their strategy is, and whether it's attractional, incarnational, you're, you're wanting to get people uh, attracted, connected, committed, and discipled. And the, the model we're most familiar with is, and this the attracted part, we're, we're opening that up as big as, po uh, as big as possible with as big a magnet as we can to bring people in. And then when they come in, we get them connected through uh, men's groups or small groups or children's programs. And the hope is that, that that momentum carries them through to be committed and to be discipled. And, and that often happens. And that happens to, to a large degree, but not as much as sometimes we thought was happening. What Willow found was that, what they used to think was that if you were attending on Sunday and you were part of a small group and you were giving, that you were growing spiritually. The focus was on this front end and there was the assumption that that was carrying it through. But they found out that wasn't the case. They found out that, in fact, does anybody offhand know what the, the number one predictor of uh, spiritual growth is? Remember, anybody remember from the study? So the, the number one predictor was um, reflection on scripture. That's one of those things when you first hear, it sounds like a government study where we spent $2 million to find out snails go slow. Uh, but what Willow was, was assuming was, again, if you were part of Sunday, if you, were, if you were part of a small group and if you were giving, that those other things were happening. What the, re the study actually revealed was in, in when you're moving to this fourth phase, this, this Christ-centered approach, that oftentimes uh, church activities worked against that because the impression we gave was it's about doing, it's not about being. That research um, was followed up now by uh, over a thousand churches, and what they found is there, there are four catalysts for spiritual growth that they found from that. Number one, not surprisingly, is embed the scripture in everything that you do. It makes sense. If the number one predictor for spiritual growth is reflection on Scripture, embed Scripture in everything that you do. The second was to create ownership. And this, this is a big one. Barna, if you read um, uh, George Barna's book, Revolution, a few years ago, he, he talked about in some, in some places the uh, church becoming irrelevant now to some of the people and, and some people leaving. And, and uh, uh, whether you're not agree with, with where he said we were headed or not, that it, it, the, what, he, what he found was based on research. And, and there are people that are part of church that want to be challenged. They're, they're sitting there and they're thinking either, um, uh, if not consciously, unconsciously, that, man, there, there should be more to it than this. The God of the universe, there should be more to serving him than just this. They, they want to be challenged. The, second, or the third thing was to pastor the local community, which is actually a great opportunity to begin to challenge people. But moving out into the community, even changing, uh, you know, churches are beginning to change their scorecard in, in how they measure success from just the, the, the traditional sort of butts, budgets, and buildings to how are we impacting our community? Are, are we bringing down the incidence of, 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 of spousal abuse, for instance? Or are we increasing the literacy rate, third grade literacy rate? How are we impacting our community? And the fourth one is, leading from a Christ-centered heart. Jesus calls us to something entirely different than the, the world is kind of projecting, this, this self-centered, um, uh, self-focused me approach. And in God's economy, death equals life and dying to ourselves. And I, I do travel around a lot. And uh, what I find is the sort of the definition of discipleship in a lot of places is, I, if I attend three out of four Sundays and I give 2% of my income and I get involved in a mission project once or twice a year, that puts me up there. And a lot, in a lot of places that makes me elder material. But really that's just sort of feeding into the, the, that self-centered, that self-centeredness self in that because I can take this to Coke and give that to God, now the rest of my life I have to do with what I want. And the reality is God's called us to so much more. Uh, I like this uh, quote by Spurgeon that as a, uh, as a Christian, we're either a missionary or an imposter. 
the reality is, I mean, the, the clergy laity divide is something that, that you know, I really want to see uh, eliminated. And, and as my friend Reggie McNeil, McNeil says, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm for paid staff, I'm for seminaries, I'm for, but I'm also for getting rid of the clergy laity divide and helping all of us to understand that we're full-time pastors, full-time ministers, full-time missionaries, whatever word you're comfortable with. We just don't all draw a paycheck from the church. And so as you think about the disciples, this, this Christ-centered part, think about somebody, not somebody you've read about or heard about, but somebody that you know personally, that you feel like exemplifies those characteristics. What are, what are some of the things just, what are some of the things that come to mind as you think about that person and you go, yeah, they exhibit this. This is why I consider them a, a disciple. What are just, any of them? I'm sorry? Servant leadership. Yeah, yeah. It's with the, the sound around here, it's kind of hard to hear all of them. But yeah, there's servant leadership. You begin to see how they, um, the characteristics that play out, the, the fruits of the Spirit, the, how they live a life of thankfulness. They have a, they have a worldview that's shaped by the Bible. And I was, reading a, I was reading a book this last weekend called Transformational Discipleship, and I was reminded by that book, too, that it's, it's not about knowledge transfer. Because if it, if it was about knowledge, simply knowledge transfer, then we wouldn't have had Judas. I mean, Judas presumably knew the rest, what the rest of the disciples knew. So it's not just knowledge transfer. It's also not simply about behavior modification. If you think about the rich young ruler who came to Jesus who said, I've kept all the commandments. Now, you know, Jesus showed him that he did have, his possessions were a God ahead of God. But most of the people, I think, would have looked at that rich young ruler's life and said, yeah, those, those are the right behaviors. So it's not simply knowledge transfer or behavior modification but a heart transformation that, that, that we're actually looking for here. And all of this, you know, we're talking about third place, and true third places and beyond. You're like, well, what, what does this have to do with, with this? It has everything to do with this. Because your systems, your staff, your facilities, I mean, this is, this is our background. This is the world that we live in. And, and, and we know in developing facilities, churches are going to spend more on facility-related costs than anything else with the, with the exception of staff. And we know that, that from what Winston Churchill says that, that we shape our buildings there after they shape us. So, so whatever you build is, is and, and wherever you are, that, that helps to set the trajectory of the church sometimes for a couple of decades. So understanding where you're headed, uh, to, to quote another uh, theologian, Wayne Gretzky, who, who credited his success with, knowing, with, with the ability to be able to skate to where the puck was going to be. And that's a lot of where we're, we're, we're trying to help churches go. And so all of this, understanding really what it is that you're trying to create is, is the first step in understanding all of the other systems and facilities and everything that comes behind after that. There's, a, there's been a significant discussion and a lot of people would say argument in, uh, in the church world for decades now between attractional and incarnational. Attractional is the, the, the model of the church that probably all of us, uh, most certainly most if not all of us, have been a part of. And, and uh, so we're familiar with that. Incarnation has been more associated, it's sort of uh, moving into the communities and birthing churches in, in neighborhoods and that sort of thing. It's typically associated with, uh, uh, with house churches, uh, organic church movement. Well, the issue isn't really, are you attractional or are you, inca are you incarnational? The issue is, are you missional? And if you, if, you think about, if you think about it from a, a missional mindset, if you put it in a missionary context, which is sometimes it's easier to think about it this way. And if we were to hear about a missionary that moved to a foreign land, and the first day he shows up, he puts up a sign in English that says, morning worship, 945 on Sunday. I mean, that would just seem ridiculous to us because we know the right thing to do is to begin to move into that area, to begin to know the people, to get to know the language. And not only that, but to get to know them well enough to understand their hurts and their dreams and their desires, to understand what the gospel looks like to them. Uh, Alan suggested yesterday that 60% uh, of the unchurched population will never be reached through the attractional model of the church. Now, I've asked uh, two of arguably the top four researchers in this area, and there's no specific research that's been done in that area, but both of them individually said, my gut feeling is it's at least 50%. And we all know that. You don't even need the statistics because you see it, you see it in our world. You see that, um, I mean, I, I was, I, a friend of mine invited me to, uh, 
to a bar where his brother was playing in a band that night. And, and I walked into the bar and it was a large uh, square bar that sat probably 40 or 50 people total and a couple of foosball tables back in the corner and the stage was off to the right and there were some round tables there. And I just sat there looking at, at, at the people that were part of that place. And, and at the back end of the bar here, there were, there were six or eight from a, a specific motorcycle gang. And I was just looking at the different groups and realizing there, probably none of these people would come to a traditional church. It was, it was going to take people move, reaching out to them. Uh, a friend of ours, Todd Wilson, uses a, um, a metaphor that I, I really like of, of an aircraft carrier. If you, th if you think about an aircraft carrier, the aircraft carrier's job is forward deployment. And the success of the mission of that aircraft carrier is based on the, the, the success of the individual missions of each of those planes. And the whole job of the aircraft carrier is to, is to launch those planes, get them out, get them back, um, refuel them, keep them safe, uh, even coordinate the individual missions. Well, the model that we typically have is more akin to a, a, a cruise ship. Where the, des where, the, where the ship itself is, a, is the destination in and of itself. And as long as people are coming and as long as people are part of that, that's a good thing. But how do we create more aircraft carriers? Ed mentioned the future traveler uh, effort that we've had an opportunity to be involved in. This has been, I mean, it's really uh, exciting. And, and the 11 uh, original future traveler pastors, their churches, they, these are guys that represented, you know, some, some of the best in, in, in terms of doing the attractional model. A couple of the churches are over 10,000 uh, 10, people. But these guys weren't interested in what's the next rung on the ladder. They were questioning whether or not we've got the ladder leaned up against the right wall. So a big part of Future Travelers has been how do we begin to take this cruise ship model that we've done very well and how do we convert it in some ways to be that aircraft carrier? How do we, how do we begin to, to move in that direction? The one of the things, and part of the problem is that we default to things. I mean, it, ideally, if you think about it, what we believe about Jesus, who we understand is the Jesus of the scripture or our Christology should drive our sense and understanding and awareness of mission and what we feel called to and what, what, we're, um, what we feel Jesus has called us to or our missiology. So our, our, our Christology should drive our missiology and that then should drive our ecclesiology or the way that we do church. The, the, the challenge is in, a lot of times in the United States, because, we, because we've been successful at this to a large extent, it continue to be in certain places. The tendency is to start with ecclesiology. And when you do that, missiology then, and, and in fact, you see this in some church planters. So they're not really planting churches. In some cases, they're planting services, hoping that churches grow around them. And when we, when we begin with the ecclesiology, then sometimes missiology, be the mission becomes a subset, sometimes internally focused, sometimes externally focused. And too often, Jesus becomes a reflection of the people in the church as opposed to the people becoming a, a reflection of Christ. The interesting, uh, one of the things that we're learning in future travelers is something that's not all that profound, in that this is nothing new. There are some significant paradigm shifts but a lot of it is going back to the Jesus of Scripture. A lot of this is, is not new at all. Ed and I have had the privilege of, um, and, and I think part of the reason that, that, that the friendship grew so quickly is that we grew up in similar backgrounds and we had fathers that, um, that came to understand this. Uh, 25 years ago, this coming November, my dad got a call. Now my dad had been, you know, his father was a pastor and he grew up in the church and and was everything a layman was supposed to be. You know, you, 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 you teach Sunday school, then you become the Sunday school superintendent, then you work on the district level, then you work on the denominational, the international denominational board. And that, and that was dad. He was, uh, served on the, uh, the board for, for one of the colleges, a trustee in one of the colleges. And, and, and that, was his, that was his life. And he was a good churchman. 25 years ago this November, he got a call from a lady who said, uh, uh, my husband, his name was George, my husband is out drinking. And, and this is a guy that had come, come to faith in mom and dad's house. And so dad went to look for him. We, we live in a small town, so we only had one bar, so it was easy to, to go there. And it, it, as it turns out, George wasn't there. But dad met Nellie and Nellie's daughter who ran the bar, or Nellie's niece who ran the bar. 
long story short, he began to he develop that relationship and started going into the bar on Friday nights and have his Diet Coke. And people would come in during the week with, with challenges that they were facing, and Nellie would say, you need to come to Pastor Jim. He'll be here Friday night. And out of that, you know, it's just there's so much to the story, but uh, out of that, it, it, Dad just connected with a whole uh, group of people that ne he never knew existed. And his heart was broken for that. And, and out of that grew a thing called the Way Station that initially was a bar without the alcohol. And that grew into a compassionate ministry center, a clothing depot, a food pantry, uh, survivors of sexual abuse, English as a second language, cocaine anonymous, narcotics anonymous. And it, it grew on from there. In fact, in God's, you know, kind of uh, um, paradoxical world, the Way Station ended up buying uh, the Goldie's Tavern and, and for a while even owned the liquor license even though they didn't dispense anything. But I saw that change him and change his, his heart. And, and he became that, um, uh, that sort of the plane on the, on the aircraft carrier. And, and that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking for. Thanks, Bill. It may seem kind of odd that a couple of contractors are talking about the things that, that we talk about, but it, a lot of it does go back to um, how we were mentored and how we were taught. And um, I'm not sure why my dad, um, who passed away last year at 84 years old, got this missional stuff when we weren't even talking about it, but he, he did. We lived along Interstate 65 in, in Indiana, and dad had a real heart for people that hurt. And so he had his business card. He was a lay pastor locally there, and, and he had a bus his business card at the hotels and gas stations at the uh, exit there near our town. And um, when people would get off the exit and um, had run out of money and were stranded, they would call our house. And so as a young boy, I grew up with those kind of people calling our house. And, and when I got to be a teenager, and mom and dad wouldn't be around, we would take the calls. And so we would go out and, and, and get them gas or food or help them work through issues. And it was just the world I grew up in. And, and like I said, dad died last year. And um, it was really a, one of the neater days in my life was his wake. And um, just this huge group of people. And there's this lady that came that was a total stranger. And so we said, well, who are you and, and why are you here? And she said, well, four or five years ago before your dad had Alzheimer's, he'd come out to McDonald's. And he said, I worked behind the counter. And she said he always took an interest in our girls. And when he came in, he was always pushing the darkness away. And I thought, wow, isn't that what we're supposed to be about with the church? Pushing the darkness of distrust or the darkness of fear or the darkness of dishonesty, or the darkness of insecurity, pushing the darkness away. And Bill talked about the church being this aircraft carrier, kind of a forward-sending model of, of, of what church should be. And I think where we've got to go is become a church that's a place of action where we're sending people out to push the darkness away. So what does that look like? What does it look like to create ministry partners um, with regards to our facilities. How do we need to rethink facilities to do that? It's interesting, in Japan they sell square watermelons. Anybody want to venture a guess on how they grow square watermelons? In a box, right? You grow a square watermelon in a box, the watermelon conforms to the box. Churchill said, and Bill mentioned this, we shape our buildings thereafter, they shape us. You spend 40% of your budget on average on facilities. And if you do that thoughtlessly, you will thoughtlessly shape your ministry going forward. It's huge. And the reason we spend so much time talking about the things we do um, with regards to facilities, all this upfront stuff about mission and our hearts and where we're going, 
is we got to think through all of that clearly so that we shape our facilities around that. A few comments from Al Hirsch on facilities. Facilities are statements of values. They have a determinative shape on our collective behaviors and actions, and we must shape our buildings missionally to get a missional expression of church. So it's a big, big deal. To create ministry partners, we have to have facilities that help shape ministry partners. We've been working with Mike Breen from 3DM, um, as well as some other thought leaders like Reggie McNeil and Dave Ferguson at Community Christian Church in Chicago, rethinking this whole facility thing and what it needs to look like going forward to create partners. One of the things that Mike Breen is learning, um, he's one of the largest missional training um, groups around the globe, he's working with over 300 churches, is this. Small groups prefer nurturing. They're small enough to care, but not big enough to dare. So if you're gonna send groups out to push the darkness away, a small group on its own will rarely be able to do that well. You'll need to, de you'll need to pull multiple small groups together so they're big enough to dare. It's an important concept, it's an important insight that we're learning. So small groups are powerful for creating connection and nurturing. But if you want to send groups into the community, you'll need to think through how do you facilitate larger groups. Which leads us to a whole different conversation about space and how people connect. It's interesting. There was a guy named Hall and a guy named Joe Ma that, that studied this and, and really developed this thinking. And another guy named Joe Myers who wrote the book Search to Belong. Some of you may remember that book. There's four kinds of relationships in our life that we need to be healthy. There's public relationships, social relationships, personal relationships, and intimate relationships. And if you want healthy people in your church you need to think through these four kinds of relationships carefully. The public relationship obviously is the auditorium typically. The social area is the foyer space, that big connecting space. And in churches today, many times the connecting space is almost as large as the auditorium, right? Personal relationships are typically small groups. Intimate relationships are one-on-one -on -one kind of relationships. When you think about the purpose of those four areas in your church, this is significant. The purpose of the public place, the auditorium, is inspiration and motivation. The purpose of the social space or the foyer is identity and extended family and action. The purpose of the personal space or small group space is nurturing and connection. And the intimate space is influence and coaching. So when you think about the design or, or how we shape those spaces, they all have very, very unique purposes. So the public, the auditorium needs to be kind of more playful vibe with compelling stories where we're helping people see what could be, what their life could be. It's about inspiration and motivation. The social space or the foyer is really the family room for storytelling, identity, buy-in, and I would add action to that. It's the action center of the church. Personal groups, um, quiet spots to nurture, and you can see with the intimate space there. But what we're learning, in an attractional ministry model, the auditorium was the key space. It was about inspiration and impact on Sunday. As we think through a more balanced, not only who are we trying to reach, but what are we trying to create conversation we're learning that this social space, the foyer, is becoming the key space. It's a very, very significant shift in how we think about ministry. Back to Bill's slide, Bill talked about ownership. We're talking about partners and pastoring the local community, reaching out into the local community. So as we think about that, the foyer must become an action center. This is a real interesting, um, it's kind of a developing insight actually. We used to think of the foyer as it was viewed when you came from the parking lot. 
What are people seeing when they come from the parking lot into the foyer, into the first space in our buildings? We want it to be warm and inviting and connecting, and we still do want to do that. But as we think about missional, as we think about sending people out to push the darkness away, the most significant insight is what people see and think as they leave the auditorium and come into the foyer. It's a major shift in how we think. And that foyer needs to become the action center, the place where people are challenged to get involved, are equipped to get involved, and are engaged in different activities to get involved. So that's where the multiple, the multiple small groups will hang out. There'll be places for people to sign up for training. This is, this is what we're envisioning. There'll be places for people um, to engage in different activities, and it'll be kind of a combination of connection um, and equipping. So think Starbucks, Apple Store, FedEx, Kinko's. It's not just about connecting, it's about equipping and sending. The foyer has to become a major action center of your church to inspire, equip, engage, and send people. Is that making sense? A major, major shift. It's no longer the auditorium is the key spot. If you're going to be a missionally driven church that sends people out in the community and connects with that 60%, the foyer becomes one of the key strategic places in your church. So as I said, that key is that transition from the auditorium to the action center social space. We're developing some prototypes and some new models on how we think about that action center space, and we don't have time here to drill down into that, but um, we'd love to if any of you would have an interest in it. But it's going to be a really different kind of space and a different way of thinking about ministry with, res with regards to how we connect, inspire, equip, engage, and send people. So to be the hope of the world, we, ha we have to become a church of action and a church of partners. We have to balance the two questions. Who are we trying to reach? And what are we trying to create? And as Al Hirsch said yesterday, if we can't figure this out and get it right, Christianity in the Western world will be a very, very different kind of thing. So there's a lot resting on how well we learn to do this. Al Hirsch also said an interesting thought is, we don't think our way into a new way of acting. We typically act our way into a new way of thinking. So another way to disciple and train people is to get them engaged. And an action center can help you do that. We would love um, to engage further with any of you on how to think about all this and what that means, what that can mean to your ministry. Let us know if we can help. That's my contact information and Aspen Group's website, Bill's contact information and Kogan's website. We both have booths here, booths here as well. So thank you and God bless.